My name is John Chian Chosi. I'm the director of public programs. And those of you who know me uh, will know that my background is associated with Theravada Buddhism. I was a Buddhist monk for many years and was fortunate enough to study under Venerable Ajahn Chah, who was one of the greatest meditation teachers in Thailand of the last century. And of course, during those many years, I had a deep respect for the teachings of the Buddha and a deep respect for Buddhism, which I still do. And what really drew me or drew me to Buddhism was that it did not require some belief or faith in the teachings and acceptance of those teachings as doctrine, dogma, and encouraged rather than believing in, inquiring, investigating, looking into, researching in various ways to verify the validity of those teachings. Now, this appealed to me because I must confess, as a young man, uh, I, I'm Italian by birth, and so my background as a child was in Catholicism, which was very much a, a faith-oriented uh, religion, and I found it extremely difficult to accept and live within that framework. My temperament, my character, my nature is to question, to doubt. You can call me the doubting John. Uh, and I don't mind that. Uh, I think it can be a, a problem, but it can also be a strength. Uh, I think to believe too easily is sometimes, most times, a fault. To be able to question and arrive at a conviction through clarity and choice, I think, is a strength. And that's what drew me to Buddhism. And this evening's talk was inspired by one of the classical discourses given by the Buddha that encouraged this very uh, same approach to all things in life, and in particular to spiritual and religious traditions. Now, the Buddha lived 2,500, 600 years ago in northeast India, mainly in the Ganges Valley. All of you know, probably, some of the stories about the Buddha, that he renounced the kingly life and went off, became an ascetic, and eventually had this transformative experience whereby he was known as the Buddha, the Enlightened One. And this occurred supposedly at the age of 35. And for the rest of his life, until he was 80 years old, he traveled, not in a car, <laughs> not in a plane, but walked everywhere in the Ganges Valley for 45 years as a mendicant, what they call a samana, one who's making oneself peaceful and is spreading the teachers, the teachings of peace. He traveled, he encountered people of all standing in, in life, very poor, rich, kingly, uh, uh, of all groups. And wherever he went, whoever expressed an interest, he shared his teachings, which now is known as Buddhism, or Buddha Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha. He did not keep any secret to himself, but he did not force his teachings on others. It was that requirement that people came, expressed an interest, asked to hear some guidance. Now, the Buddha was not the only mendicant at that time in Northeast India. There were many other religious and spiritual seekers of various traditions who taught various things and various paths. One of the contemporaries of the Buddha 
uh, were the Jains or the naked ascetics. And there are many references to the disagreements between these groups. But there were many other teachers. And it was a custom that the spiritual mendicants, quite often existing on arms, in other words, they would be uh, without possessions or very few possessions. I guess the naked ascetics had the least possessions. <laughs> Uh, but the Buddhist monks were allowed to have robes and an alms bowl with which to collect alms food in the morning. So they would walk from village to village, but not stay in the villages or the towns. Most often the monks would walk and they would stay in secluded places such as forests, mountains, caves, or quiet places conducive to meditation, conducive to the spiritual quest, but not at such a distance from the town people or the villagers that they would not be able to walk to the village in the morning to collect alms. And this established a very wonderful tradition uh, of Buddhism, and that is the interdependence, the mental Buddhist monks were dependent on the lay community for their material support, food, clothing, shelter, medicine. In order for them to have that support, they had to be with, within close proximity that enabled the lay people to support the monks but then also enabled the lay people to gain teachings from the monks so that the monks were not hermits, completely isolated from the lay community. And often that relationship meant that as monks would travel, walk from place to place, they would stay in a, say, in a small grove, maybe one or two miles from the village. The village people will, would know, oh, these ascetic monks are, are visiting this area. Let's go and see them. And so they would go to see the monks, or they would see the monks walking for arms in the morning, and afterwards they would go and see the monks where the monks were staying for that evening. And they would go to see them in order to question and to receive teachings. And so this was the tradition of the time. It was a very simple arrangement, uh, but it, you know, it, it is still something that is practiced in many Buddhist countries. I know that in Thailand, uh, that was one of our practices when I was a monk, that we would at a certain time go on what they call in Thailand Tudong. And this is like, you go on this sort of pilgrimage from place to place, and you would stay out in, in the forest or the groves, and you would walk for arms in the morning, and the villagers would come in the evening to see the monks and receive teachings. So this is a tradition that is still alive today. And this, discourse that I want to speak about this evening takes place in such a setting in the Ganges Valley in a particular village called Kesaputta. I don't know where that is other than it's in the Ganges Valley in one of the kingdoms that existed at the time of the Buddha. And the clan or the group of people living in that area were called Kalamas or the Kalama clan. And so it is said that the Buddha traveling with a number of monks, they always say a large retinue of 500 monks. Uh, and that just means a large number of monks. I don't know how many, I doubt it was 500. But they were traveling, they were walking from village to village. They came to Kesaputta and they found a grove that was quiet and secluded and they settled down to spend the night there, meaning they would sleep under the trees just with their robes and bowl, spend their time meditating. The Buddha would instruct the monks. Sometimes there would be discussion. Now the villagers, 
the Kalamas of Kesaputta heard that the Buddha had come to visit and they were very excited because they'd had heard uh, good news about this great spiritual teacher. And so they gathered together in the evening to visit the Buddha. And it says that they went as a group and greeted the Buddha. Some of them paid respects. Some of them were kind of skeptical about it all and casual and just sat down. And then they, they had conversation with the Buddha. And they started with a very interesting request. And I think this request is something that resonates very much with us today, 2,500 years later. This is what the Kalamas said to the Buddha. So the Kalama Sutta means the discourse to the Kalamas. And it's translated from the Pali, which is uh, the vernacular that was spoken in the, in the Ganges Valley at the time of the Buddha, related to Sanskrit, just a simpler form of it. But this is one of the translations taken from segments of this discourse. So the, the Kalamas approach the Buddha and they sit down and they say, Venerable Sir, these monks and Brahmins who visit Kesaputta, they expound and explain only their own doctrines, the doctrines of others they despise, revile, and pull to pieces. Venerable Sir, there is doubt, there is uncertainty in us concerning them. Which of reverend monks and Brahmins spoke the truth and which falsehood? Now, of course, you know, this is pertaining to, in particular, to monks that, and Brahmins, priests, teachings. We have some of that today in the sense that there are many different religions, many different spokesmen people for those religions who claim to know the truth and have their doctrine that they preach and teach and encourage and insist that it is the truth, that it is the right path, that it is the only path. And this we will find amongst many traditions. It's not limited to any one religious group. It's across the board quite often. You know, I think it's very common. And more so though, than these different religious and spiritual dogmas that divide humanity and have divided humanity over the millennia and have caused a tremendous amount of conflict, pain, suffering, destruction, exploitation, degradation, this viciousness that comes from addiction to a, do a religious dogma that then sets one against the other. Over the centuries we have seen these religious conflicts throughout the Western and Eastern uh, spheres, hemispheres of the world. And I don't think there is any one tradition or one religion that can claim to be completely innocent of this. I used to say Buddhism had one of the best uh, histories in terms of its, you know, it's very difficult to, to commit acts of oppression, destruction, and uh, war in the name of Buddhism. That is true because the Buddhist teaching is quite clearly against those acts. But nevertheless, Buddhist people have gone to war and waged war against others. So that this is a calamity, really, of humanity or a cancer of humanity, whereby something even like a spiritual teaching is then used to cause some, not only destruction of life, but degradation. And this is rather sad. But these days, you know, living in a country such as we do in America, 
I think even though there are religious and spiritual tensions um, and maybe disagreements between different religions, it's not so much in the forefront. It's not the main thing that's creating conflict, disagreement, polarization, hatred, anger amongst the citizenry. It is more to do with things of politics and other aspects of life, views and opinions. And the problem today is that it's not only monks and priests who are coming forth with these various views and beliefs and teachings. It, we are inundated. We are being bombarded from all around. Social media is all around 24-7. What used to be the newspaper that you would read maybe once a day is now 24-7 all the time through social media, through uh, television, radio. But it, it, and it's coming with all sorts of points of view and opinions about Thing. And it is very confusing for us to know whom should we believe, who is telling us the truth. It is a time when truth seems to be, uh, you know, uh, 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 an unknown. It used to be that we could probably agree on some basic facts. These days it's seems that we can't agree on the most simple fact. There are alternate facts, my facts, your facts, this is the truth, that's the truth. So we are in a state of confusion, often not knowing who to believe, what to do, in which direction to go. Now when the Buddha was teaching the Kalamas, they were referring specifically to spiritual guidance. But this same situation applies to all forms of guidance with regards how we will live our lives, how we will act, how we will choose to act in society, respond to situations, relate with our neighbors, so that this is a state of uncertainty as to what path we should go on as we strive to create a better life. So the Buddha said, yeah, <laughs> it's proper for you, Kalamas, to be in doubt, to be uncertain. Uncertainty has arisen in you about what is doubtful. I mean, it's a fact. Why is there so much disagreement? Well, there are so many opinions. There are so many uh, sources of information from so many different perspectives, points of view, individuals, organizations, that it is hard for us to know what is right. Is there a right? Is there a good? What is the good? The right way. <laughs> challenging for us. Whom should we believe? Not only with regards to religious teachings, but with regards to everything else, every other point of view or standard. So this is the Buddha's advice. Come, Kalamas, and the language is rather, you know, old-fashioned. That's the translation, really. Do not be led by reports or tradition or hearsay. Be not led by the authority of religious texts, nor by mere logic or inference, nor by considering appearances, nor by the delight in speculative opinions our delight in thinking and proliferating about things, nor by seeming possibilities. Well, it could be. 
nor by the idea, this is our teacher. In other words, this is our leader, he must be right. So these are some very important standards not to use for deciding what is good or what is bad. It's not saying it's not good or, or that it's bad. It's just saying you can't go on these premises, the reports. It's in the news. It's in social media. It's on Facebook. It's on uh, CNN. Uh, it's on Fox News. It's what people are saying. Is That's not necessarily good, true, or fact. You can't just take it on hearsay that it's spread around by many people, repeat it over and over. Tradition. We are all conditioned by our traditions. Some traditions are very good. Some traditions are not good. One of the things that I find very interesting in America is this great reverence for the Constitution. And it, I must say, I, you know, I was born in Italy. I grew up in Australia. I had not encountered this, this notion so strongly before coming to America. But it's like this tremendous reverence for the Constitution, which is really, it's a, a remarkable document. That is true. But it's not perfect. There are a lot of things in the Constitution that reflect the failings of the human beings who wrote it. And it should not be because it's in the text, the religious text or any text should not be the basis for taking something for granted as being correct, good or appropriate. It should be questioned. And this is also true of religious texts. The idea that a book is holy and everything in it is absolutely perfect, to me, is unacceptable. I, I don't, it may be, but I'd like to look into it. I'd like to question it. I'd like to be able to verify something for myself whether it's a Buddhist text, whether it's the Quran, whether it's the Bible, the Torah, or the teachings of Madame Blavatsky. I think it is very, almost a necessary requirement for a true spiritual seeker that we are willing to question, look into, and verify before accepting blindly. And I think this is not only for spiritual teachings, but all forms of inf information that come our way. It's absolutely necessary that we are responsible, intelligent, resourceful human beings with the desire to question and not just believe blindly or easily. Not to be a, a complete skeptic and just say, ah, oh, it's everything is, there's no truth. There is nothing that you can, there is no standard. Nobody knows. That's giving up on life. I think we can do better than that. So, not by mere logic or inference. This is quite often uh, a difficult one for us educated Western people is that we re rely so much on our intellect that, and, and we trust our intelligence and you know, it's very difficult for us to sometimes question our own position and this is also important. So the Buddha is saying don't just take something for granted from any one of these, for any one of these reasons. Rather, when you know for yourself that these qualities are unskillful, these qualities are blameworthy, these qualities are criticized by the wise, 
These qualities, when adopted and carried out, lead to harm and to suffering. Then you should abandon them. So he's putting this forth as a standard for us to inquire, a measuring stick, if you wish, with regards how we approach life, how we should approach life, how should we live our lives, based on what? If this mode of living is conducive to the arising of suffering, the arising of harm, pain, if it's hurtful for us, hurtful to others, if we see that as the consequences that arise from a particular way of living, we should abandon it. We should not follow it. When you know for yourself that these qualities are skillful, these qualities are blameless, these qualities by the wise, these qualities when adopted and carried out lead to welfare and to happiness, then you should accept them and follow them. So the general principle here is, you know, what's right, what's wrong? What should, how should you live? How should, what should you do? What shouldn't you do? Look at what comes from it. What are the consequences of living in a particular way, of acting in a particular way, of speaking in a particular way? What are the consequences? If it's conducive to suffering for oneself or others, it should not be followed. If it's conducive to welfare and happiness, peace and prosperity and well-being for oneself and others, it can be undertaken, regardless of where that guidance is coming from. Now, this sounds simple. Um, it's, it's, it is simple, <laughs> but life is not simple. Life is complicated. You know, it's, it's not so easy to discern. It's very difficult to often to discern what is the best way to live. And that's why even amongst well-intended people, we find so much disagreement. And often, well-intended people end up in conflict. And well-intended people even go to wars. It's quite sad. So this guidance given by the Buddha, it, it shouldn't be, for a start, it's not as simple as it sounds. It is, does require quite a lot of careful consideration. And the most important thing is that it shouldn't be taken to mean that what you think is good and right because you think it's good on and right, it must be good and right. Because we, right now, are also limited by our conditioning. Our views are limited. Our understanding is limited. And so, quite often, what we see is within, uh, you know, it's like within a, We've got these like horses walking <laughs> down the road with these screens that we only see a certain portion of life. And so this, for us to really arrive at understanding the best way or a good way to live requires careful and rigorous consideration of the consequences of actions. Sometimes being short-sighted, we think that doing this is good and this is appropriate. Why? Because it's what we're being taught. That's how we're conditioned. And we don't see the bigger picture. So for this rigorous and careful consideration of action, 
the Buddha said that we need two very important um, qualities in order to be able to really make a decision. The two necessary factors are wise reflection and having noble friends. Wise reflection is a very important term in, in Buddhism. Yoni so manasikara. Yoni so manasikara, the Buddha said, was the quality of carefully investigating, methodically analyzing, to see the relationship, to get to the root cause to get to the source so there is the source and, uh, and the result it requires careful reflection not just based on my belief or my preference and the other quality that the buddha greatly stressed was having noble friends and as you if you remember the previous slides where the buddha said praised by the wise because we are limited in our understanding, it is necessary to, you know, have some guidance from those who may know better than us, rather than assuming our own position. So, wise reflection is the ability to question and test our own beliefs and views in an appropriate and methodical way not to just, because that's the, what we believe, that's what we're going to keep believing. It's a, you know, we, we can grow. And to guard against our limitations, then it's very important to check, to have some check on one's own understanding, one's own point of view, to have some um, reflection, because quite often we don't see ourselves quite as well as others. So noble friends, the Buddha said that is one of the greatest things for us to have as for a spiritual life to be successful is association with wise and noble people, people who are already mature in their understanding, mature in their the qualities that make for a, 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 a person of character, of moral standing, of judgment, of values that can help others. And there are such beings. And of course, this is what we normally would hope our spiritual teachers would be and le religious leaders should be, <laughs> and also our political leaders should be. The idea is that these people are endowed with some nobility of character and virtue and judgment, that they can be leaders and provide leadership. Unfortunately, there are many people who climb to the position of leadership who lack these qualities. And this is across the board uh, in all institutions, religions and political and social positions in life. It's just uh, un really true and unfortunate. And that's why we find so many failed leaders across the board in all institutions religious, political, and social. And often in the saying that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, because with power, with authority, comes temptation and opportunity. And if the person is flawed, they will fail. And that's why we hear over and over again. But one would hope that there are, and I do believe that there are, leaders, spiritual leaders, social leaders, 
political leaders who are endowed with virtuous qualities, good judgment, good intention, and can be good mentors. In other words, give us good advice. Now, that was the Buddha's uh, overall. He said, OK, you're getting all of this information from all of these different teachers. Some of them say this, some of that say that. Don't just believe it. Don't just reject it. Question it. Look at it. What's the consequences of following those, uh, that way of life? Is it going to make for happiness or misery? If it's going to make for misery, don't. doesn't matter who's saying it. Ignore it. Abandon it. Even if God manifests in front of you and says, you go and kill those infidels. No, sorry, I don't kill. <laughs> it hurts. Even if this book tells you that it's all right for you to go and uh, exploit and, and kill and steal and, and no. <laughs> If your leaders, be it political leaders, statesmen, military leaders, whatever, encourages you to do something which is destructive, no, I'm not going to do it. So the Buddha then, rather than just leaving it there, he wanted to give a little more guidance. He wanted to give a little more structure to this way of assessing and determining what we should do, whom we should follow, how we should live. And he came to this teaching regarding motivation. And he pointed to things that can motivate unskillful way of living. And these are classical Buddhist, they, sometimes they're called the three poisons, loba, dosa, moha. They are the three fundamental defilements from which spring all other forms of negative tendencies. Greed, hatred and delusion, <laughs> the usual translation. And greed is that, you know, for me and mine, <laughs> at the expense of anything else. And hatred, of course, is, you know, get rid of anything that I don't like. At the ex who cares about anybody? And these are really basic uh, forces. And delusion is that very state of not really knowing and based on some really false ideas and beliefs about the nature of existence, how I'm more important than anybody else, and that, uh, you know, if somebody else is happy, that means it's at my expense, that no, there is no hope for us to live together in peace. We're meant to be at odds and conflict. So the Buddha said to the Kalamas, he said, uh, now, what do you think? And he, he goes through these three de uh, root defilements one at a time, and this one is for greed. You know, if somebody is overcome by greed, um, will it be for his benefit or his harm? I mean, it is when we're under the power of greed and we live led by this greediness, will it, I mean, What's the consequences of that? And so the Kalamas, you know, they're very respectful. They, they, they say it's for his harm. I don't know how they know so quickly, but they agree with him. So the Buddha says, Kalamas, being given to greed, this greediness, this selfishness, this obsession with me and for me only, because I can't share with anybody else. <laughs> and being overwhelmed and vanquished mentally by greed. So it's an intense selfishness, preoccupation with me and mine. This man or woman takes life, will kill for it. People will kill, yeah. They'll steal. 
They commit adultery. They lie. And not only do they do those things, they encourage others to do them as well. Now, this is, uh, you know, it's an extreme case, but let's look at it as, and, and observe ourselves when we are, you know, why do people steal? You know, it's often it's greed, <laughs> but then he goes through this for greed, and then it's also for hatred and delusion. So that these, based on these, root defilements coming from the greed, hatred, and delusion. That's what people do. So when people go out and kill and steal and commit adultery and tell lies and exploit and hurt and destroy, it's from greed, hatred, and delusion that they do those things. They may not see it immediately. Sometimes it's cloaked in the sense of righteousness so much cruelty, so much killing, so much stealing has happened throughout history and is happening today. And we read about it all the time because of this righteousness. They feel that it's right when it's coming from greed, hatred, and delusion. And the consequence is misery and suffering for many including themselves. He who lives by the sword has to be very afraid of that uh, somebody else's sword chopping off their head. We see so much of the world up in flames. So many parts of the world where this madness has taken over or continues to, to take over humanity and sets one group against the other to the complete destruction of communities. So many millions of people. It's very depressing just to see that human beings can be so blind and feel that they're doing the right thing. So the Buddha says, coming from greed, hatred, and delusion, if the motive if our motivation, if we're being motivated by these negative tendencies, we will act out. We will act out these volitions in a destructive way by killing, stealing, abusing people, lying to people, cheating people, exploiting people, exploiting others, exploiting everything, including the whole planet. <laughs> It's the, the worst side of humanity. But within us, there is the potential to be motivated by something positive. And these, the Buddha, in the classical Buddhist terminology, as just a negation of the negative one. So negating a negative makes a positive. Non-greed, generosity a willingness to share, a seeing that the happiness of others doesn't have to be at the expense of my happiness. My happiness does not have to be at the expense of others' happiness. We can share. Being motivated by generosity, we are able to share with others. We are able to share and live together and find that maybe there's enough to go around. Non-hatred, loving kindness, or compassion, consideration, respect for life, respect for others' feelings, respect for others' possessions, respect for the planet, non-delusion, wisdom, clarity of mind, mindfulness, discernment that can see clearly the relationship between what we do and what comes of it. So there is this, like our eyes are open. And so we have this capacity within us to break out of just the habitual instincts of self-preservation, self-gratification, the self-centered obsession at the expense of everything else, and 
embrace the oneness of everything through generosity and loving kindness and this clarity of vision that knows how to live in a way that's constructive. So these are the positive, if you wish, motivators that are possible within us if we generate them. And if we do generate and come from these positive motivations, the consequences of it are positive. So this is what the Buddha said. If we, and here he puts it in this negative over the negating the negative. I, you know, the absence of greed. Let's say, if, the, if there is generosity within, within the heart of a, of a man, is that for his benefit? Yes, that is for his benefit, because when we are motivated by generosity, then we are not over, we are not going to kill, we are not going to steal, we are not going to commit abusive acts in life. We're not going to cheat and lie. When we're truly generous of heart, when we have loving kindness, when we have discernment and understanding, we will not act in a way that is hurtful and harmful for ourselves and others. And so this, the Buddha says, is what will be for the benefit and happiness of oneself and others. And in Buddhism, it's always oneself and others. So this, these, you know, these were, the Buddha put it as a, you know, suggestion, saying, well, consider your motivations. What are you motivated by when you act? And really, decide whether it's going to be for your good or, for, or not. And so he's stressing the importance of our intention. And in the Dhammapada, these verses of the Buddha, the first two verses make this very clear, is mind is the forerunner of all evil states or bad things. Experiences are led by and produced chiefly by the mind. If one speaks or acts with a corrupted, impure mind, suffering will follow just like the wheel of an ox cart when the ox pulls. The wheel follows the ox. The second verse is the opposite of that. Mind is the forerunner of all good states. Experiences are led by and produced by the mind. If one speaks and acts with a pure mind, Happiness will follow along, just like one's shadow that never leaves. So this is the importance of intention, volition. Where are we coming from? Is there greed? Is there hatred? Is there some sort of blind belief that's motivating us here? Have we taken the time to really consider the consequences of our actions. So this is a reflection for us in terms of what to do, who to believe, how should we live our lives. And there's so much information out there. I, you know, it's difficult. I would very much encourage this self-inquiry, whatever it is, whatever information that's coming in, what is it increasing within us? What, what is it fueling within us? When this information, when this teaching, when this doctrine, when this whatever source it's coming from, we receive, what is it f feeding in us? And you can, you can know what it's feeding. As you partake of it, what's being, what's the, um, what's it feel like? I mean, is greed being generated? Is anger, resentment, hatred being stoked within you? Is confusion and just 
just this sense of, well, I don't know anything anymore. Is that being stoked in you? That, that source, whatever it is, whoever it's coming from, whatever it's coming from, is something that you should be very wary of. Whatever is coming that's encouraging you to be reflective, to try and weigh things and see which one may be a little more accurate, that encourages you to have clear thinking. Maybe that's the sort of guidance that will be useful for you. And again, you've got many mentors in life to be guided by. And not only living mentors, I mean, who do you respect? Who do you respect in life? Who would you like to be like? Who would you like your life to emulate? Very few of us would want our lives to emulate Adolf Hitler. And there are many other people. We, we would not want our lives to be that. There are others whom we respect, we do honor, we do see they have values and qualities that are inspiring to us. What guidance did they leave? How would they measure? Maybe they could be good mentors for us. So the Buddha then finishes with this incredible uh, teaching about the four sublime abidings of mind, the four Brahma Viharas, the abidings, the divine abidings, states of mind that are so pure, so refined, so beautiful that they are worthy of Brahma, the highest God, or the, the highest divinity. The mind of loving kindness, loving kindness, the mind of boundless compassion, boundless sympathetic joy, boundless unshakable equanimity. To, he said, this, these are the qualities of mind that will uplift. And he said, a disciple of the noble ones, you know, people who are worthy, noble, have good judgment, who in this way are devoid of coveting, devoid of ill will, undeluded, clearly comprehending and mindful. So this is the mind that's the quality that one would aspire to. How would they abide? He, she, they, lives, having pervaded with the thought of loving kindness, one quarter, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above, below, across, boundless, he dwells, having pervaded all living beings everywhere, the entire world, with the great, exalted, boundless thought of loving kindness that is free of hate and malice. And he repeats this for the other qualities, for loving kindness, for compassion, sympathetic joy. Sympathetic joy means rejoicing at the happiness of others. It's the complete opposite of envy. <laughs> it's the ability to be happy when others are happy. So, an equanimity, that unshakable peace of the mind. So he pervades, he, because the mind is pure, he dwells with this. These are the pure emotions of a truly noble being or a truly noble being. The natural emotion of a heart that is free of greed, hatred and delusion is to live in this world and relate 
in a way that is all kind, compassionate, rejoicing, steadfast, stable, sane, peaceful. So this is, you know, a really um, a wonderful <laughs> thing to aspire to, but we cannot necessarily live it fully. But it is good to at least be aware that it is possible for us as human beings to rise up and be divine. Divine in the sense of this purity of heart and mind that is full of kindness, generosity, compassion, and sees oneself in others and others as oneself. For one who lives in this way, the Buddha said, there are four assurances. You feel four confidences living in this way, being of this nature. The first assurance <laughs> is very, this is quite interesting what the Buddha says. If there is a hereafter, in other words, if there's another life, <laughs> if there's something after death, you know, we don't know. We believe this, we believe that, but he say, well, you, if you don't know, that's fine. If there is something after death, a heaven or a hell or whatever, and there is the result of the deeds that we have done in this life, then that's all right. I'll likely have a very good rebirth. I mean, having mind of this quality, being motivated by these virtuous, by these really positive attributes, living in this way, I don't have any fear of death and what comes after. And if there's nothing after, <laughs> if there is not a hereafter and there is no result of deeds done in this life, well, I will at least free from hatred, free from malice, safe and sound and happy. The greedy man is not a happy man. The angry man is not a happy man. That, that is not a happy state of mind. Being freed from hatred is happiness. Being freed from greed is happiness. So even if there is not a life or anything after death, that's all right. You've lived a good life and you're happy. Now, the this re this result of actions, this thing about karma, well, you know, if you do bad things, bad things are going to happen to you. Okay, well, if unskillful actions do result in painful consequences, I need not fear that such results will come to me because I abandon the unskillful actions. If unskillful actions do not result in painful consequences. Any, you know, if this whole thing about karma and its results and is just a load of, who knows? <laughs> I'm at peace with myself being free from guilt and remorse. When we look back at our lives and we look back at how we live, we want to be peaceful. My father passed away many years ago, but, uh, and I had a, a strange relationship with my father because I greatly disappointed him when I became a Buddhist monk after his great uh, generosity at, uh, and hard work so that I could have a, a good livelihood. Uh, he worked very hard to make that possible. And then I, I, left it all behind, went and became a Buddhist monk. He, he was very disappointed. Um, and for many years he was very hurt too. But after 15 or 16 years, he kind of came to terms with it. And um, 
you know, we, 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 our relationship flourished after that. And I remember vividly when he was, I think it must have been around the age of 70 or something. 60, he must have been 65 or 70. He told me something very, uh, very important. There was a maturity, uh, something matured in him. And this is when we reconciled. For a start, he said, okay, you're a Buddhist, are you happy? I said, yes, I'm happy with what I'm doing. He said, good, then I'm happy too. The other thing, and it was this associated with that time, he went and settled things that had been festering <laughs> for many, many years, a relationship with his brother back in Italy, a conflict that had go, went back 40 years, property, land, typical Italian, <laughs> some, you know, disagreement, and they would not speak to each other. This, you know, 20 years, 30 years, I don't know how long it was. He went back to Italy to settle everything clear everything, resolve everything, come to an amicable agreement with his brother, relatives, and everybody. He went back to Australia and he said to me, I'm settling everything because when I die, I don't want to have to carry any of this with me. I want to die peacefully. And I think it was, a, you know, for me, it was incredibly inspiring. It indicated a degree of maturity and depth of understanding of what is really important. When we look back at our lives, when we look back at how we lived, we want to feel at peace. We want to be at peace. We don't want to be burdened by remorse, regret, guilt. We want to be at peace and have a sense of self-respect that we led a good life. And I think this is something that we must remind ourselves of daily because it is so easy for us to think that this is so important, that's so important, and compromise. You know, we know that's not our best, or we know that's not the best way for us to live or the best thing for us to do. We know that we'll regret it, but we still do it. And that is rather sad. So this, you know, these assurances that if we live a life that is worthy, but also the sense of having this sense of self-respect or being at peace with oneself, we would hope that we would come to this conclusion. So it is, blessed one, so it is, sublime one. The disciple of the noble ones Venerable Sir, who has such a hate-free mind, such a malice-free mind, such an undefiled mind, and such a purified mind, is one by whom here and now these four assurances are found. In other words, they, they thought, wow, that's really great. Uh, yeah, I guess if you live that way and you have those qualities, you can feel confident. You will be peaceful. So, that's my presentation for this evening. Based on this, um, the Kalama Sutta, and if there is any takeaway that I would encourage this evening is to be an intelligent skeptic, <laughs> to question and not just follow 
to investigate deeply, to try and see the uh, relationship between how we live and what comes of it. And with regards to information that we're receiving, whether it's custom, whether it's tradition, whether it's doctrine, whether it's the news, whether it's the media, what is that feeding within us? If we feel that it's feeding greed, selfishness, if it's feeding this hatred, us against them, if it's feeding confusion, blind belief, don't take it in. <laughs> I would have avoid it. If what's coming, whatever doctrine, whatever dogma, whatever news, whatever source of information, whatever uh, hearsay, whatever people are saying around us, what's it feeding? If it's feeding the sense of kindness, you know, respect for others, respect for life. If it's feeding generosity, the wanting to help others, wanting to share, if it's feeding, encouraging us to be intelligent and question and not dogmatic, to use reason, to use our intelligence, if it's logical, reasonable, and it's encouraging this, these qualities within us, maybe that is something we should accept.